I'm going to read a few poems from a recent book called Chinese Whispers. I always have to explain this title because it's a, a British term for the game that we as children probably played called telephone where you whisper something to somebody and they whisper it to their neighbor and it gets passed around the room and comes out as something completely different. In England they call it Chinese whispers and it has a further um, meaning as sort of the grapevine or the rumor mill, I believe. Now, so some of these poems are, are prose poems. The first one is, I, I won't bother to indicate which or which, but it's quite difficult to tell in most cases whether the lines go to the end of the page or not if you're not looking at them. And this first one they do is called A Nice Presentation. I have a friendly disposition, but I'm forgetful, though I tend to forget only important things. Several mornings ago, I was lying in my bed listening to a sound of leisurely hammering coming from a nearby building. For some reason, it made me think of spring, which it is. Listening, I heard also a man and woman talking together. I couldn't hear very well, but it seemed they were discussing the work that was being done. This made me smile. They sounded like good and dear people. And I was slipping back into dreams when the phone rang. No one was there. Some of these are perhaps people having to do with anything in the world. I wish to go away on a dark night to leave people and the rain behind, but I'm too caught up in my own selfish thoughts and desires for this. For it to happen, I would have to be asleep and already started on my voyage of self-discovery around the world. One is certain then to meet many people and to hear many strange things being said. I like this in a way, but wish it would stop, as the unexpectedness of it conflicts with my desire to revolve in a constant, deliberate motion, to drink tea from a samovar, to use chopsticks in the land of the Asiatics, to be stung by the sun's bees and have it not matter. Most things don't matter, but an old woman of my acquaintance is always predicting doom and gloom, and her prophecies matter, though they may never be fulfilled. That's one reason I don't worry too much, but I like to tell her she is right but also wrong, because what she says won't happen. Yet how can I or anyone know this? For the seasons do come round in leisurely fashion, and one takes a pinch of something from each, according to one's desires and what it leaves behind. Not long ago I was in a quandary about this, but now it's too late. The evening comes on, and the aspens leaven its stars. It's all about this observatory a shout fills. Disagreeable glimpses. This is a, a title taken from a, a work by a piano piece by Satie, the Aperçu Désagréable in French. After my fall from the 16th floor, my bones were lovingly assembled. They were transparent. <clears throat> I was carried into the gorgeous dollhouse and placed on a fainting couch upholstered with brilliant poppies. My ship had come in, so to speak. There were others, lovers, sitting and speaking nearby. Are you the Countess of C? I demanded. She smiled and returned her gaze to the other. Someone brought in a tray of cakes which were distributed to the guests according to a fixed plan. Here, this one's for you. Take it. I looked and saw only a small cat rolling in the snow of the darkened gutter. If this is mine, then I don't want it. Abruptly, the chords of a string quartet finished. I was on a shallow porch. The village movie palaces were letting out. I thought I saw a cousin from years back. Before I could call out, she turned, sallow. I saw that this was not the person. Conversations continued streaming in the erstwhile twilight. I betook myself to the toll booth. The pumpkin yellow sun lit all this up, climbing slowly from ankles to handlebar. 
He had shaved his head some seven years ago. The lovers were bored then. They no longer meandered by the brookside, telling and retelling ancient secrets, as though this time of life were an anomaly, a handicap that had been foreseen. In truth, these labels don't go far. It was I who made a career in singing, but it could just as well have been somewhere else. Indeed, the dust was sweeping itself up, making sport of the broom. The solar disk was clogged with the bristles of impending resolution. Which direction did he say to take? I'm confused now a little. It was my, mis- it was my understanding we would, in joining hands, be chastised, that the boss man would be sympathetic, the sly apprentice, unresonant as a squatter's treehouse. See, though, it wasn't me that dictated that dictated the orbits of the plants, the viburnum at the door. And just as I had called to you the image decomposed, restlessness of fish in a deodorant ad, by golly, Uncle Ted will soon be here. Until it happens, you can catch your breath looking about the walls of the familiar nest. But his flight was delayed for five hours. Now someone was interested. The travel mishaps of others are truly absorbing. He read from a large timetable, and the helium balloon rose straight up out of the city, entered the region of others' indifference and their benighted cares. Can't that child be made to stop practicing? In another life, we were in a cottage made of thin boards above a small lake. The embroidered hems of waves annoyed the shoreline. There were no boats only trees and boathouses. It's good to step off that steel carousel. The woods were made for musicianly echoes, though not all at once. Too many echoes are like no echo or a single tall one. Please return dishes to main room after using. Try a little subtlety in self-defense. It'll help, you'll find out. The boards of the cottage grew apart and we walked out into the sand under the sea. It was time for the sun to exhort the mute apathy of sitters, hangers-on, ballast of the universal dredging operation. The device was called candy. We had seen it all before, but were never let on, not until the postman came right up to the door, born on the noble flood, racked, By jetsam, we cry out for flotsam, anything to stanch the hole in the big ad. We all came to be here quite naturally. You see, we are the lamplighters of our criminal past, trailing red across the sidewalks and divided highways. Yes, she said, you most certainly can come here now and be assured of staying, of starving forever if we wish though we shall not observe the dark's convolutions much longer, sob. Utterly, you are the under one. We are all neighbors if you wish, but don't under any circumstances go crawling to the barrel organ for sympathy. You would only blow a fuse, and where is the force in that? I know your seriousness is long gone, facing pink horizons in other hemispheres. We'd all blow up if it didn't. Meanwhile, it's nice to have a chair. A chair is a good thing to be. We should all know that. The last trail unspools beyond Ohio. This is a... Thank you. Thank you. This one is called Theme Park Days. Dickhead, they called him. For his name was Dong, Tram Van Dong. Carefully, he slid open the small Judas in his chest and withdrew a heart-shaped disc. It appeared to be cut from thicknesses of newspaper, crudely stapled together. There was handwriting on one side, spirit writing, he indicated with a motion of his head. Yet it all seemed for naught ancient stock market quotations or chalked messages on hoardings of the last century with plus and minus signs 
featured prominently. Oh, vos omnes, he breathed, blown together like milkweed on the hither shore of this embattled plain. Will your feet soon mean to you what once they did? I think not. Meanwhile, the tempest brays. Favor is curried. The taffetas of autumn slide toward us over the frosted parquet, and this loquat heart is yours for the dividing. Sailboat of the Luxembourg. Vibrations of crisp mornings ripple ever closer. The joiner joins, the ostler ostles, the seducer seduces, nor stirs far from his crimson hammock. Delphic squibs caparison the bleak afternoon, and the critics love it, eat it up, can't get enough of it. More pap, more pap. Have a care, though, lest what I tell you here trespass beyond the booth of our conniving. Yet it will spread as surely as an epidemic becomes the element we have chosen to live in, our old infectious experiment. This is a sh short one called Why Not Sneeze? Again, a title taken from somebody. In this case, it's a work by Marcel Duchamp, with whom I share a birthday. Uh, I believe his work is actually a sort of small birdcage filled with lumps of sugar that are actually marble blocks. Oh, dark days and punctual, always backing into our alley, feigning surprise for the umpteenth time. Why don't you just go away? Leave us to the land that binds us and itself to present methods. Leave the golf course simmering in light that is steeped too long. It's the same with us dull on certain days. Wake up, you're looking at this magazine. Thank you. Thank you. View of Delft. The afternoon is slow, slower and slower until a full stop is reached long before anyone realizes it. Only the faintest nip in the air causes these burgers to become aware that their time is passing too, and then, but fitfully. Go stack those bricks over there. See what that horse is doing. Everything around you is waiting. It is now apologized for. The sky puts a finger to its lips. The most optimistic projections confirm the leakage theory. Another drop in temperature is anticipated. It's all about standing still, isn't it? That and remaining in touch with a loose-fitting impression of oneself, oneself at 15, out at night, or at a party in the daytime. Oh, sure, I knew it was me all along. Then the sneezes got up to go. Un okay. The Lightning Conductor. The general was always particular about his withers. He lived in a newspaper tent. Someone had let fall beside an easy chair. Telling the man with no fingers what it was like to smoke a cigarette in the 20s, we proceeded naturally to your cousin Junius. His plan was to overtake the now speeding tortoise by digging some kind of a fire trench in its path, which would cause it to wonder fatally for a second, after which we could all go back to channeling the news. There's a story here about a kind of grass that grows in the Amazon Valley that is too tall for birds to fly over. They fly past it instead. Yet leeches have no trouble navigating its circuitous heaps, and I want to throw celebratory banquets afterward at which awards are given out. Best costume in a period piece too distracted by the rapids to notice what period it is, and so on. Before retiring, the general liked to play a game of all-white dominoes, after which he would place his nightcap distractedly on the other man's crocheted chamber pot lid. Subsiding in a fitful slumber, warily he dreams of the giant hand descended from heaven like the slope of a moraine 
whose fingers were bedizened with rings in which every event that had ever happened in the universe could sometimes be discerned. Sometimes you end up in a slough no matter what happens, no matter how many precautions have been taken, threads picked from the tapestry that was to have provided us with underwear, and now as bare as any grassless season on whatever coast you choose to engage. It's sad that many were left behind, but a good thing for the bluebirds in their beige houses. They never saw any reason to join the vast, confused migration, fucking like minks as far as the spotty horizon. It doesn't get desperately cold anymore, and that's certainly a lucky anomaly, too. Thank you. I asked Mr. Dithers whether it was time yet. He said no to wait. I, I guess you all know who Mr. Dithers is, so I won't bother to annotate that. Time, you old miscreant. Slain any brontosauruses lately? You. Sixty wandering days, I watched him navigate the alkali lick. Always a little power ebbing, streaming from high window sills. Down here, the tetched are lonely. There's nothing they can do except spit. We felt better about answering the business letter once the resulting hubris had been grandfathered in, slowly, by a withered sage in clogs and a poncho, vast as a delta, made of some rubbery satin-like material. It was New Year's Eve again, time to get out the punch bowl, make some resolutions. I don't think. Thank you. I'll read, I guess, three more. Um, this one is called Local Legend. And uh, the uh, personage in it, Dr. Gratis Ad Parnassum, that name comes also from French music. Uh, WC has a, a suite of piano works called the Children's Corner in English. And uh, one of them is a kind of uh, parody of the finger exercises of uh, Clementi that many of us had to play when we were studying piano as children. And uh, Clementi had a course of study called uh, called Gratis Ad Parnassum, and this WC chose the name Dr. Gratis Ad Parnassum for this sort of finger exercise-like piece. Arriving late at the opera one night, I ran into Dr. Gratis Ad Parnassum, hastening down the marble stair, swan-like. I wouldn't bother if I was you, he confided. It's a Verdi work written before he was born. True, his version of the Faust legend is unique. Faust tempts Mephistopheles to come up with something besides the same old shit. <laughs> Finally, at his wit's end, the devil urges Valentine to take his place, promising him big rewards this side of old Smokey. Then, wouldn't you know, Gretchen gets involved. They decide to make it into a harassment case. No sooner does Faust hit the street than the breeze waffles his brow. He can't say where he came from or if he ever had a youth to be tempted back into. The bats arrived. It was their moment. Twenty million bats fly out of an astonishingly low culvert every night in season. I kid you not. After a cursory swoop or two, they all fly back in. It all happens in a matter of minutes, seconds almost. Which reminds me, have you chosen your second Mephisto wants you to use this foil. It works better. No, there's nothing wrong with it. Hours later, I stood with the good doctor in a snow-encrusted orchard. He urged the value of mustard plasters on me. See, it makes sense. Yet we both knew they are poisonous in some climates, though only if taken in minute quantities. See you again, old thing. Thank you. Okay. Runway. We crawled out of the car 
into the rest stop. Lady Baltimore cake was served by Madame du Barry lookalikes. Don't hurry, Mr. Executioner, one chirped, pressing the unwanted crumbs against my lips. It'll all be over in a second, she added encouragingly. Red Skelton asked me if I had a book coming out. He seemed drowned in lists of trivia and itching powder dreams, the kind that make you wake up and then sort of fall back into sleep again. His brother was cleaning up after the elephants. He wore a crisp white uniform. Could have been a soda jerk or just a jerk. My scented glove offends the daintiest among them, for they have no recourse but cries of old London, an exhaustive repertory, one first thought. But soon its coda reared a clutch of mordant shrieks. I supposed it was the witching hour. Nothing unusual happened. Soon we were leaving home forever to be pitched about on storm-tossed seas, flagrant to be back amid multiple directions. For though there are some who can live without compasses, it dissolves all complexity if one is perpetually in the know. Sleep, directions... That's all I need at my chaste fireside to take in the sights just as the wind starts and darkness longs to take us down a peg. The last one is called Business <laughs> The Business of Falling Asleep 2. There is a, a The Business of Falling Asleep 1. Um, prefaced with a line of Rambo. Par délicatesse, j'ai perdu ma vie. Through politeness, I lost my life, more or less what it means. And this is a prose poem. Days, things, times of day, big things like unseen bells, unheard moments. Suburbs are pale orange and a greenish blue I associate with fire escapes and school. The school looms now, a person with five questions at its back. They can't stay there for now. They'll be back. The interrogation was like a question mark. Once you stop to listen, you're hooked. No, go back to the stone, please. What did it say over the stone? Don't say I can't remember. You remember everything. That is true, but I'll remember the stone. Like the face of only the third dead person I'd ever seen. Well, it's happened, he seemed to be saying. The eyes were closed. I suppose they always are. What are you going to do now? We don't have to stay like this. We could meet perhaps outside, have a tea like we used to. They moved the hotel boat to a less ostentatious location. Still, it felt hard coming to you through trees and other animated life. Its music doesn't gel. Yes, but a weird, creepy feeling came over me that you might know about all this. Not wanted to tell me, but just know. It's amazing how the past shrinks to the size of your palm, forced to hold all that now. Falling down the steps in Marlborough Street. That was just one thing. But others I don't know, never will know, are cupped in the hand as well. To brave the day, turning outward like an ear, too polite to hear. Rambeau said it well, though his speech could be clamorous. One accepts that too with a broader parterre of accepting a load of sun coming over the house to dampen discreet repair. I'm sorry, discreet despair. I like repair. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> woven into the togs of somebody standing to go, having remarked on the time as though there were a time to go. One would rather be left with few words and the resulting remainder of unease than never to have left the party. Visions of a terrace with a cell phone ought to be engraved on the waiting skull like Brahms. Anxious in the predicate, but adept socially, pressure to have the music come out in a certain place where it can be abandoned if desired. How about it? I care too much not to leave it all. Set this down, too. Thank you.